Welcome to episode 62 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr. My guest this week is Charles Brewer, CEO of DHL e-commerce, and we talk about e-commerce in developing markets. We cover e-commerce in Africa, including growing markets within Africa and cross-border e-commerce in Africa. We talk about cash on delivery, addressing, and e-commerce fulfillment centers in developing nations. Very interesting chat. So coming up in a moment or two, Charles Brewer, CEO of DHL e-commerce. we get to Charles Brewer and e-commerce in developing markets, let's talk about cross-border e-commerce in Australia. The federal government recently proposed legislation that will impose GST, the goods and services tax, which is currently 10%, on almost all inbound e-commerce purchases. Suppliers with sales into Australia of over $75,000 will be required to register for GST and remit the tax to the Australian Taxation Office. Right now, goods with a value of less than $1,000 are exempted from GST when imported directly by consumers into Australia. This low value threshold of $1,000 was set in 1985. Shifting the threshold to zero will bring in an estimated extra $300 million in GST for the Australian government. The model of tax collection proposed by the Australian government will mean that marketplaces such as Amazon and eBay will have to collect the tax, not the individual vendors who list on those marketplaces. Unsurprisingly, Amazon and co aren't too happy with this arrangement. They'd rather the Australia Post collect the GST. Australia Post, for its part, said that if it was forced to collect GST on inbound international items, it would cost the federal government roughly $900 million a year, slightly more than the $300 million in extra GST the government estimates it will recover. But look, that's just a really, really brief overview of the current situation. The details are, of course, much more complex. The new measures to be introduced from the 1st of July this year, although a Senate committee that reviewed the legislation recommended that implementation be delayed until 2018. Interesting times ahead for cross-border e-commerce into Australia. Joining me now on the Postal Hub podcast is Charles Brewer. Charles is Chief Executive Officer of DHL e-commerce. He's a star on social media. If any of you are following Charles on Twitter, he's very active over there and on LinkedIn as well. Charles, Welcome to the Postal Hub podcast. We're going to talk about cross-border e-commerce, e-commerce in emerging markets, because it's something you've got a lot of experience with. Prior to being CEO at DHL e-commerce, you were Managing Director of DHL Express in Sub-Saharan Africa. So let's start with Africa. I'm an international man of mystery, Ian, as you rightly pointed out. In fact, I was looking the other day. I, you know, you have those lovely things that come up on Facebook and says, you know, plot all the countries you've been to. I think I've been to 87 countries now around the world, which is pretty good. But as you rightly noted, my role prior to being the CEO for DHL e-commerce, I was running Sub-Saharan Africa, which is a fantastic place, I hasten to add. For those who are listening who haven't been there yet, get yourself along to Africa. It's a really, truly beautiful place. Aside from being a fantastic future opportunity in terms of business, it's a great place to visit. But to the point, e-commerce in Africa, and there are a number sort of sub-regions we're looking at that we think are particularly exciting from Latin America across to the Middle East, which I'll talk about separately in a second, I'm sure, with some exciting news there just recently with some acquisitions. And of course, Southeast Asia, which is a little bit less emerging than perhaps it was before, but also hugely exciting. But to the point in talking about Africa, you have to sort of contextualize why is Africa interesting from an e-commerce perspective in the first place. And as I said, having lived and worked there for five years and and traveled across 37 countries, the answer is very, very simple, which is once you get north of South Africa, there are something like 10, maybe more, maybe a few more now, but 10 or 12 shopping malls in the rest of Africa. So for 52 markets, a billion people, there's something like 12 shopping malls. And even if you happen to be lucky enough to live near one of those shopping malls, if you want to try and get to it with the traffic that exists in Lagos or in Nairobi or in Addis Ababa or wherever it may be, it'll take you a while. So therefore, with the sort of in the absence of having very easy access to shops and 
malls like you know most of us have, the obvious answer is to shop online. And the second reason is, even if you are, do have access to those shops, you know some of the products and items you may want to buy may not be readily available and they may not be genuine. That's a big issue in Africa. And the third reason is, of course, that the middle class and the sort of disposable income is on the rise. So people have a lot more money, and it's a relative statement, but they have a lot more money today than they did a few years ago. So limited access to shops, limited access to the products they want and more money in their pocket to, to spend on the sort of aspirational goods that uh, most people want. So on the rise, the biggest market are clearly South Africa, Nigeria, South Africa biggest, and then uh, Nigeria number two, and then Kenya number three. But you've got lots of other countries that are growing really, really fast too, and in growth percentages are growing much faster than those three big ones. So places like Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Mozambique, Zambia, Zimbabwe even, Angola. So a lot of all, a lot of these countries are growing real, real fast in terms of online e-commerce. So a very exciting space, as with most parts of the world. Relatively few players from a marketplace perspective. Uh, Naspers and a few others have some interest there. Rocket have a big interest in Africa. So relatively few players. And as always, and no great surprise for today's conversation, logistics is one of the hurdles you have to get over. So some challenges, but on the rise, Africa is definitely the next exciting frontier. And you've just mentioned the logistics being a challenge and the traffic. I think that traffic is probably something that a lot of the emerging markets have in common. Africa, maybe in some parts of Southeast Asia, you have huge amounts of traffic for very dense populations. What kind of a challenge does that present when it comes to delivering on time for an e-commerce delivery? Many. So again, I've had many wonderful experiences traveling across Africa and seen some wonderful things. But one particular memory I, I shall take with me for a long time is I used to have to go to Lagos uh, pretty regularly. as one of our second biggest markets in Africa. And uh, driving from the airport down to the island, which is where most of the business is done, can take you anything from sort of, if on a really good day, it can take you 40, 40 to 45 minutes. And if you're really unlucky, as I have been many times, it takes two or three hours. And uh, on one particular trip, I was racing to try and get to a conference to speak at, actually, on Victoria Island. And it was a conference all around the urban cities of tomorrow and how to deal with them from a logistics perspective. So hugely relevant. And I sat in this awful traffic jam. And it was taking more. It was going to take three hours or so. And uh, in the end, I'm keeping the story fairly short. I ended up taking three cars, a boat and walking about 100 yards. But the boat part of it was most relevant because there's a lot of water around Lagos, Nigeria. And it gave me the cunning idea, which is this is, you know, you can't push water up a hill with a rake. So um, we now use a very fast boat. I gave the country manager there the permission to go and acquire a boat, not knowing that when I came back, he would have bought probably one of the fastest boats in Africa. It now takes DHL 13 minutes to get from the airport to the island as opposed to three hours. And, and I use that boat every time I go there now. I think that the truism of that story is that in Africa is really like the other areas we're going to talk about, but Africa is truly a very exciting environment. It's a billion people. You know, the, the e-commerce is growing at 12%. It's already worth 2 billion in uh, GMV. So a very exciting space. And it really, really has only just started. I mean, we're right at the start of this journey. But if you want to operate there, and I, and I recommend to your listeners and, and to anybody who's thinking about doing business in Africa, do so. It's a great place to be for, get to get first mover advantage. But you have to be creative in how you deliver on your promise. You know, so um, if you're going to be in logistics, which we clearly are, it's not as simple as sort of having a man in a van and being successful that way. You have to sort of sometimes think outside the box in Africa, whether it be drones or helicopters or boats in Lagos, Nigeria, to an order you can deliver the smile in the last mile. And let's talk now about cross-border because you've mentioned about the emerging middle class, spending power and the lack of shopping malls north of South Africa. Are we seeing cross-border e-commerce within the continent or coming in from outside? It's both. Both, actually. So, again, very unlike other regions. So, for example, if you look at Europe, something like 70% of what's produced in Europe stays in Europe. So, a huge dependency on, on sort of the European Union and the, and the countries that uh, are representative. In Africa, it's different. Something like 17% of what's produced in Africa stays in Africa. So, they are a net importer from outside of Africa. So, a lot of volume coming in from China. Something like center trade is coming from that origin. So, for the most part, cross border is into Africa from parts, and the Americas actually, but so from other parts outside of Africa, so as I mentioned, from the US or from China, which is, again, not, if you look at the biggest trade lanes in the world, most start in either the US or China, but um, certainly from an African perspective, it's more inbound from outside rather than from intra-Africa. And when it comes
comes to um, methods of payments, there's a discussion we've had previously on the podcast about in some parts of Europe, credit card or debit cards are the main method of payment when people buy online. But outside of many Western European or North American countries, you might find that there are other methods of payment. How do you deal with that as a and with your DHL e-commerce hat on now, Charles? How does a delivery company cope with having to deal with cash on delivery and other payment methods? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So I spent most of my life sort of in the space of COD and and cash on delivery or CCOD. And uh, I remember only about sort of nine months ago, we were at a meeting in Germany and I was talking to my board colleagues around some of the um, requirements for our last mile platform, the platform that we use that orchestrates courier routes, that orchestrates uh, collection of money, orchestrates delivery windows, orchestrates delivery to the backs of back of cars and, and so on and so forth. So you know that last mile platform is really critical. So get it specking out the requirements is even more important. So we were talking through that and I was talking to my European colleagues about the importance of COD and CCOD and, and he looked at me with slightly crooked head to one side and he said, why is it such a big issue? I said, well, it's enormously important in in the emerging markets and the rest of the world, actually. So why? So in Europe, what is the COD percentage in Europe? And I think it's less than 2% or something, or less than 3%. And I said, aha, now I understand why you don't see it as a big problem. Because in Africa, it's much more like a 70 to 80% of all deliveries are um, COD or CCOD. And, and for the most part, it's COD. And for many other parts of the, the areas of the geographies I look after, so India, Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific, in general, the, the story is very, very similar. So for us, CCOD and COD are really an important part. And it comes through, I think, in particular for two or three reasons, and the importance for, you know, in terms of what we do and how we play into that. One is, you know, the consumer especially in emerging markets, is still somewhat unsure about the online experience. So, um, and, it's, and it's changing every day, but it's still a relatively new space for most consumers. So paying in advance for something they're not sure they want or will want when it's delivered is still a big question mark, hence why COD and CCOD exist. Secondly, CCOD, which is credit card on delivery, is still fairly small, a very small percentage. So people still prefer to pay in cash. And again, for lots of reasons, access to banks, access to credit cards, trust, credit card fraud, and many other bits at all. So for the most part, we're dealing in cash. And then the third one, and this one I didn't really appreciate until I came into this space, which is the importance that the role that we play as logistics providers in making sure that what we deliver is delivered fast so that the customer pays their money and their money goes back to the marketplace, the merchant, the brand, or the retailer. So what we found in the Middle East, as an example, when you deliver, if your delivery is a little bit slower than next day or two days, the person that was going to pay $50 or $100 for whatever they bought, sometimes that money is spent elsewhere by the time you make the delivery. So being very efficient and effective in delivery and fast is another way of ensuring you minimize the return level. And as you probably know, Ian, in the e-commerce space, and particularly in emerging markets, that return percentage can be sort of north of 30% in some markets. So, And that has a huge impact on the seller. So our role, and we have, you know, I think the battleground today is actually in logistics, but our role when it comes to the COD piece is to be as fast and as efficient as we possibly can be so that we have the highest opportunity of A, delivering it, and B, collecting the money and returning those funds, remitting those funds to the seller. So the third one in in that story, I really wasn't acutely aware of until I moved very directly into this space about nine months ago. It's very interesting that if we are a few minutes late or a day late, that money's gone elsewhere. It could be the child schooling. It could be a beer whilst watching the football. It could be whatever. So, you know, speed of delivery really plays a big part in effective delivery and minimizing those, those returns. Let's talk about another issue we've discussed a number of times on the podcast, which is addressing outside of Western Europe and as the risk of stereotyping. There can be areas of the world where there are no addresses or where addressing is informal. How does a, a global operator like DHL come to grips with these sorts of very local issues? A combination of technology and manual intervention. And, and for the most part today, it's manual. And then the problem you articulate in is an absolute real one. So and that that's true in Africa. It's true in the Middle East. It's true in Southeast Asia, even in Thailand. We, we started our operation in Thailand about our last mile operation about a year ago now. And even there, you know, which is a, a very modern country with a, a very large development agenda, with Thailand 4.0. Even their addresses are somewhat difficult to locate 
for the courier. And going back to the point I made earlier on about the last mile platform and how that orchestrates effective courier route planning, which is so critical in this space, as in every second, every minute of inefficiency adds cost to the last mile, which is an expensive place to play in the first place on a very fairly low selling price. So it's really important we're as efficient as we possibly can be in orchestrating our courier routes. If you have a courier who is sitting in his vehicle or on his bike who has to stop and make phone calls, ringing up the customer and say, well, where is house number 33? You know, that adds a huge amount of inefficiency and adds a huge amount of cost and it adds a huge amount of customer dissatisfaction. So the short version is we come at it in two ways. We come at it with technology. So we use a lot of pre-alignment before the career, before the the address and the package is allocated to routes. So a lot of technology goes into messaging the customer to say, okay, drop a pin on the map where you are and send that back to us on email. That drives the, the last mile platform. So we use technology to do that. And we also still today have to make a lot of manual phone calls to verify addresses. So it's still a case of having to work with both the seller and the recipient to locate them in many, many markets. And then you have two or three new innovations hitting the street and working very, very hard to develop systems that I think will help marketplaces and merchants and sellers and logistics companies to become even more efficient in the delivery. So a combination of both. But I have to be honest, for the most part today, the only way to solve that riddle is to get on the phone and call the customer. Let's let's wrap up quickly, Charles, because we, we're almost out of time. Um, and I wanted to talk to you a whole lot about these new e-commerce fulfillment centers that seem to be springing up everywhere, thanks to DHL. But Charles, we're well, just a quick question then about e-commerce fulfillment in developing markets, shall we say, if you look into your crystal ball, is there a likelihood of e-commerce fulfillment centers like the ones you've been setting up in Hong Kong and Sydney and around the world springing up in some of these developing markets? A hundred percent. So it's all about the e-commerce industry is moving far more towards a consumer-led industry than perhaps a seller-led industry. So customers, consumers, when they buy, when my wife who spends far too much online, but when she does buy online, she wants it when, where she wants it, she wants it when she wants it and how she wants it based on her sort of decision. So us or the industry sort of telling her you can have it in five to seven days is no longer acceptable. And to fulfill that sort of consumer demand of I want it faster, I want what I ordered closer to me and delivered quicker, you're seeing this sort of rise of fulfillment centers around the world. So the sort of singular fulfillment centers for a country or singular large form fulfillment centers for a region no longer really meet the requirements. So certainly from a DHL perspective, we've rolled out in Australia now, as you know, we've rolled out in Asia, as you know, we've rolled out in India, the Americas, and we will do a lot more so we can place the product as close to the customer as we possibly can. Charles Brewer, CEO of DHL e-commerce. Thanks very much for joining us on the Postal Hub podcast today. A pleasure, Ian. That's all for this episode of the Postal Hub podcast. Thanks again to my guest, Charles Brewer, CEO of DHL e-commerce. Coming up next week, Dean McCuba with his ideas on how to reform the US Postal Service. Also coming soon, the changing use of mail, autonomous vehicles, and the role of the post office in e-commerce. Make sure you never miss an episode. Sign up on iTunes. You can hit subscribe there and you'll get every episode downloaded to your device. You can also sign up for the Postal Hub e-newsletter. It's a weekly update with all the latest podcast bits and pieces and other news go to thepostalhub.com and sign up there we've got a company page over there on linkedin as well you can follow us there or you can connect with me personally but remember send me a message to say who you are when you click that uh, connect link send me a message just to say who you are that you listen to the podcast or something like that and that way i'll almost certainly say yes if you have a topic you'd like to suggest for a future episode of the podcast just drop me a line ian at thepostalhub.com is my email address I'm Ian Kerr. Thanks for listening in, and I look forward to your company next time on the Postal Hub podcast.